Matt. Okay, let's start. Pizza is gone. Please come downstairs. Have a seat and okay. So my name is Gerbi Darutzi. I'm one of the organizers of the Hungarian Art User Group. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to welcome everyone today. This is, I think, a very special event in the series of our Vita. This is pretty special due to multiple things. One is that the Hungarian R meetup was founded a bit more than five years ago. Actually, it was the idea came up in 2013 at the user conference and Silag was uh, urging me, the sitting right there, to start this R user group. I'm very, very grateful for, for those suggestions because at that time I had no idea what could came out of this idea. At the first meetup, there were like 13 of us sitting in a small room, and this event was organized mainly by uh, Gary Tote and myself. We were writing emails to university departments, printing small posters, and then, then sharing it to friends. And 13 people would come together in a small room, and we didn't know each other. We were just trying to figure out what are we doing with R, and we had some very exciting conversations like, have you used ggplot? And oh yeah, 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 that, 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 that's what I do when it comes to plotting. Then have you heard about this other random package? No, okay, you should give it a try. So we had these kind of conversations and we decided that we should come together like once a month and discuss these great topics. And after five years, we have 1400 members at the Budapest users of our networks, which is I think a bit insane. I mean, for a niche language like R and for a small country like Hungary having 1,400 members here, uh, that's great. So I'm very grateful for everyone who had uh, bringing this to life, like the co-organizers co helping with the venues, catering and so on. Just for the record, many times the organizers were ordering and paying for the pizzas and delivering beers in, in small bags for the group, uh, just because I think uh, it's great to have a local community for the R language, except for times like today when we have a sponsor providing venue and catering as well, so thanks a lot for Prezi for doing that. And I'm also very grateful for the speakers. Uh, we had some very well-known speakers in the past years. I think Roman Francois was the first international guest who was speaking about RCPP four years ago. Then we had Mandoli and also Arun from Data Table giving talks, and I think that's why Data Table is re really well known in Hungary. And many other speakers, both at the meetups and at the local R conferences, like we had the Saturday conference two years ago, the European R users meeting in May with overall like 6,700 attendees. So uh, that's, I think, a great success. We had speakers from CRAN, from Arcor, and I will not try to you know, list all the great speakers we had. But this is a special day because we had many good speakers, but we did not have in the past like the unofficial rock star of the R community. So uh, I'm very happy that, that this happened after all, yeah. although I must tell that I tried to in my head a couple of times, both for like Iram and Saturday and then and for other events as well. But keeping in mind that he has a very, very busy schedule, of course, I understand this could not happen sooner. But anyway, I'm very, very happy that he's here now. So I will just shut up now and then, then Hadley, the stage is yours. And please, everyone, join me back on Hadley Wickham. Thank you. So today, uh, this is kind of a mystery talk because I uh, didn't give uh, Google any uh, title or abstract. So I'm gonna, I, what I want to talk about is the kind of the design of functions. And I've called this talk the design of everyday functions, which might ring a bell if you've ever seen this book, which is a really fantastic book about the design of everyday things, of physical objects. And so my kind of goal today is to show you some kind of ideas about functions, give you a way of thinking about functions, 
just sort of think about it like this crazy looking teapot, right? You can easily tell that this is not going to be, this is not a well designed teapot, right? It's going to be very hard to pour tea out of that. And hopefully, at the end of this talk, you'll have a little bit of a sense of like, how can you think about functions in that way? How can you look at kind of the outside of a function and say, well, this is a well-designed function, or this is a poorly designed function that, that's going to be a little confusing. And in, in thinking about this talk, I've been thinking quite a lot about, in some sense, kind of like the, the difference between me and, and, and you all. Like, I spend my day basically exclusively programming in R, writing packages that other people use. Like I do very little like data analysis anymore. I sort of do data analysis like at a distance. Like I make a package and someone else uses that package to do data analysis. So I'm kind of always a little worried, like am I gonna drift off into this la la land where I create like these tools that make me like amazingly powerful, but no one else can understand what the heck I'm doing. Um, so I, I, I do like to think a little bit about this, this sort of continuum between the kind of practitioner and the, the programmer. Uh, and I think this is a little bit of a continuum of like how far away are you from the data? So I'm pretty far away by and large, right? I'm not, the data isn't right there in front of me. I'm creating a package and then someone else is gonna use that package to analyze the data. I think for most of you, you know, you're working with data right, right there in front of you. And some of this thinking was inspired by this really great blog post that Yi Wei Xia, the creator of uh, Knitter and R Markdown, wrote recently about the first notebook war. Because I think one of these sort of tensions between like practitioners and programmers is, is how do you like interact with your programming language? Like, are you primarily in a notebook? Or are you primarily in an IDE? And I think you know different different people need different tools. And Yiwei does a really great job of kind of of discussing that and like you know what 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 makes Jupyter notebooks like so appealing to Python users and what makes our Markdown notebooks so appealing to our users. It's uh, quite a long blog post, but it's really worth worth reading. But so to me, like one of the, the differences between being sort of a practitioner and a programmer, as I said, is like how close are you to the data? Like when you're a practitioner, like the data is right there in front of you. You're interacting with it. And if something goes wrong, you can easily tell that something's gone wrong and you can fix that problem. Where if you're more on the programmer side, you're kind of operating at a distance. So maybe you're writing code that other people use, so maybe you're writing R packages, or maybe you're still writing data analysis code, but that's being like run in production. It's no longer on your computer, it's no longer being run in an interactive context, but it's being run sort of somewhere a little bit further away from you. That's a little bit harder to debug when something goes wrong. And so I think, so Jenny Bryan suggested this is like, and when you're a practitioner, you hear your code scream when something goes wrong. But when you're on the programmer side, you know, things break and people scream at you. And now I want to emphasize, this is not like a dichotomy, right? You're not either a practitioner or a programmer. You will be like somewhere on somewhere a little different on the spectrum every day of your life. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about kind of moving a little bit more towards the kind of programmer side. Think of some of the things that I think about every day that I think it's also useful for you to think about as well. And just to kind of lead into that, I think flipping from like who is doing the programming to the types of tools you use, like when you're a practitioner, I think you are basically having a conversation with your data. And you can tolerate ambiguity because you know, if there's any ambiguity in a conversation, you can ask for clarification and get it. Whereas if you're a programmer, your code is a script, not in the sense of like a scripting language, but like you're, you're describing a sequence of tasks that the computer is gonna carry out without you directly supervising it. And ideally, you want that code to kind of scream early and often so that you encounter problems early so you can fix them like locally before your code is run remotely. And so I want to talk about this with a few examples from R and the, the tidiness. So I think kind of the first example of this is like strings as factors equals true. 
So I've kind of like positioned this even to like the left of practitioner. This is something I don't think anyone really wants. Like it was a good decision at the time it was made, but this idea like genuinely like 20 years ago, turning all of your character vectors into factors for you automatically, that was a good idea and was helpful. And today that is not so true, but you know, R is a very conservative language. They don't want to make breaking changes, so we're kind of stuck with this decision. So data frames are kind of similar. They're pretty, they, they, they make some, there's sort of some ambiguity there. They, they like make some decisions for you. Whereas tibbles, I kind of like characterize tibbles as being lazy and surly. So they do less and they complain more. And you might wonder, well, why should you want to use something that is lazy and surly? But this is the sort of what I mean by, by laziness and surliness. So here I've got a data frame. Uh, and I've created this variable called X, Y, Z, and data frames are really helpful. They're really helpful in two ways. So first of all, when you just type some part of your variable name, data frames are going to helpfully complete that for you. And they're also being helpful because at the time they were written, character vectors were kind of slow and annoying, so they've also helpfully converted this to a factor. Whereas tibbles being lazy and surly are not going to do that. When you try and access a variable that does not exist, it's going to complain and it's not going to do anything. So I think this sort of decision, like this is there's less kind of ambiguity here. There's like the, the tibbles are doing less for you, they're making fewer guesses. And like data frames are great, like don't get me wrong, they're, they're these, they're, they're, but they're designed like really to optimize your interaction, your conversation with the data. And these, like, automatically trying to guess what you want, these behaviors start to get more frustrating the further away you and the data, you and the code get. The other package I wanted to briefly talk about today was the conflicted package. How, have any of you heard of this package before? Like three of you, okay. Four of you. That's great. Um, because even if you don't remember anything else from this talk, this is the one thing you should remember, because I think it's a really uh, cool idea. So basically the idea of the conflicted package, so normally in R, when you load two packages that each provide a function with the same name, the last loaded package wins. And what that means is if you're gonna get a really confusing error message, because you're giving like completely the wrong arguments to a function. You're gonna get something that's completely mystified. And the idea of the conflicted package is to turn that ambiguity and instead of resolving it for you automatically, it's gonna create an error. And this is a little weird to me still, like in the way that like tibbles are lazy and surly and that's a good thing. Like here we're taking some automated behavior and getting rid of it and making an error instead but this makes it much, much easier to detect when two packages have a conflicting definition for a function of the same name, and then you are forced to resolve it explicitly rather than relying on some heuristic which works some of the time and fails other times. And then kind of the last thing that I've been thinking quite a lot about over the last few months is this idea of tidy eval, right? This is something that kind of exists way over here on the programmer side of things. Ideally, like you don't want to, have to care about this, um, but if you do, you want something that's like theoretically sound and, and actually works. And so my goal today is to kind of help you move a little bit in this direction from implicit to explicit, from practitioner to programmer, because I think this helps you write code that like works more reliably. Like at work, you're obviously all writing, already writing code that works for your data in front of you. How can you also write code that works for the data that's not immediately in front of you? Or if it doesn't work, at least gives you a good error. And to do that, we first, we first want to think about like, well, what makes a good door? It's a little bit of a weird question, but I think it's quite important. There's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it. Do you rate this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? 
So when you like when you use like something badly designed in the real world, like a door that needs to be pushed, but all the signals it's sending you are telling you to pull, it's very easy to blame yourself. To think like, oh, I'm just like dumb, like I can't use this door. But when you see like person after person after person trying to use the door and failing, it's a sign it's not about you, it's about the design of the door. And this is not true just about doors, but also about functions. And one of the things that, that got me started thinking of along these lines is this, this rather long quote from Jenny Bryan about like the apply functions in BASAR. And that I think a lot of people, like they have to, they sort of believe like, oh, I, I, like, I know a for loop is like bad, and I shouldn't be using it, and I should be using the apply functions instead, and they kind of feel guilty about it. But you've like tried to learn the apply functions, and they just don't like stick in your brain. And you're like, well, oh, I just must be like too dumb to understand what's going on. And that's absolutely not true. It's like not your fault. There's something about the design of those functions that make them hard to learn. And so I don't want to like just pick on uh, base R here because there's also many functions in the tidyverse that have the same problem. So spread and gather, um, spread and gather, like at the time I wrote them, it was very, very clear to me like what direction spread was and what direction gather was. And then Jenny Bryan, like I never remember what it was now, but she, she gave me this like metaphor involving a tube of toothpaste and it like completely broke my understanding of like which, which one is which. So then I think there's something wrong with like the design of spread and gather, which makes them like harder to use than they should be. Another, another topic that many people complain about is like, how do you get rid of legends in ggplot? This is again like person after person like complains on Twitter, like I could not remember this. And so when you experience those feelings, I think it's natural to blame yourself. But you shouldn't. You should blame the author of that function. Like, you should blame me. I love. And so to kind of so that so I think this idea of like the, there's, there's something about the design of like how do you make a door easy to use or how do you make a function easy to use that I think is really really important. And so before we get into what makes a good function, I want to talk about what makes a bad function or in fact whacked makes a bad function. How many of you are familiar with the word whacked? This is like a specific technical term in the English language, which I'm not going to explain what a what is, but uh, you'll see very shortly. And if you want to see an entertaining talk about programming languages, I really recommend this WAP talk. Uh, and if anyone ever gives you like grief for using R because it's like this weird, bizarre language that does all these strange things, like this talk is all about like how literally insane JavaScript which is like one of the most popular languages. So. so I'm going to show you a few snippets of R code, and they're pretty short, so I want you to try and like run that code in your head and predict what the output will be. And all of these are going to involve the C function, which hopefully everyone has used before, right? The goal of the C function is to combine two things together. So what happens if you try and combine a factor with levels A and a factor with level B? What do you get? What? This is so surprising, <laughs> but it's not like what, it's what? Well, what happens if you have a date and a date time and you try and combine them together? This gives you such a weird result that it actually took me a long time to actually parse this correctly, but this is the year 4,210,927, January 24th. <laughs> well, what happens if you flip the order? What if you do the date time and then the date? What? <laughs> you get a date in 1969. Well, what even happens if you have a date time that you've carefully constructed with the right time zone? And what happens if you just don't, if you just concatenate with, it, with itself, with nothing? Well, you've lost the time zone. It's now in the time zone of your current, of your computer. 
which when I ran this was in the US. No. Well, what happens if you combine it with an actual nothing, which in, in R is a null? What are you going to get? You get what? You get this crazy big integer. So these are some sort of like, the, these surprises are bad, right? When you run a function and your, your mind is completely blown by what it returns, I think that's a sign that there's something wrong with that function. And so I want to talk about kind of one aspect that I've been thinking about a lot lately that helps you kind of understand like a function from a high <laughs> level. And that's kind of the idea of the type of the function. So the types kind of give you like a high level overview. And so I'm going to write them with these uh, angle brackets to kind of make it clear that I'm showing you kind of pseudocode, not real code. But here I'm saying if I combine a factor and another factor, what C gives me is an integer. Or if I just take a single date time with a time zone, I'm going to get just a date time without a time zone. Right, so these types are kind of a high level way of looking at what a function does, not in terms of like the actual values it does, but they're kind of the shapes of the things. So I'm hearing, I hear I'm using like type, not in any kind of technical programming sense, but just like, like the type of thing, like is it a factor, is it an integer, is it a date time, whatever. And so to understand like where C works, because you probably used it a bunch and it's been fine in the past, to understand like where it works and where it fails, we need a little terminology. And that is in R, there are four so-called atomic vectors, logical, integer, double, and character. So these are called atomic vectors because these are like the atoms of R, like these are the simplest components the simplest data structures in R, and most of the more complicated data structures are created by joining these atoms together in various ways. And if you're just working with atomic vectors with C, the rules are pretty simple. That kind of when I, so if you you hear, so if I have a logical and a logical, I get a logical. If I have a logical and integer, I get an integer. If I have a logical and double, I get a double, right? That, so it's a little hard to see the pattern here, but if we kind of rearrange this into a table, it starts to get a little bit easier. So if I combine an integer and a double, I get a double. If I combine a character, well, with anything, basically, I get a character. And if you stare at this table for a while, you might notice that it's basically symmetrical. Right? So everything, unless I've messed up my construction of this table, everything on the other side of that line should be the same. And so it turns out we can make this even simpler, is we can just draw this like sequence from logical integer double to character. So whenever you combine two of these atomic vectors with C, you get the most complicated one. Right? Logical can only have three possible values, the integers of the set is smaller than the set of possible real numbers, and then characters are the most complex of all because a character vector is made up of strings and each string can be any length. So whenever you combine two vectors, atomic vectors, you're always going to get the most complicated type, the most complex type. And I think this is simple enough that you've probably never seen, that you don't have to study this, right? You just internalize these rules from your use of R, which to me I think is the importance of theory like the idea of having some theory that underpins all of this is not that you sit down on like day one and start learning theory because for like 99% of the world that is the most boring way to start. For like 1% of the world, which is probably overrepresented in this audience, uh, it's <laughs> the best way to start. But for most people, like it's better to learn with like some practical, with some concrete examples and then learn the theory from application rather than seeing the theory first. So I think what's important here is that there's some simple underlying theory. You don't need to be taught it, you just internalize it from your use of R. But the problem with C is, is that when it breaks down when we get to these S3 vectors. So S3 vectors are vectors made using the S3 object oriented system, which is so called because it came from the third version of the S language like a bunch of historical trivia that you probably do not care about, unless you're in that 1% of people again. 
Uh, and these, so these are really important data types like factors, uh, POSIX CT. This is a great another piece of historical trivia, right? Why are date times an arc with POSIX CT? The CT stands for calendar time. The POSIX, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but this is like some standard for representing date times. Unfortunate that you are that is inflicted upon you. You just have to memorize and remember that means date times and then dates. So factors are built on top of integers, POSIX CT and dates are built on top of doubles, and C knows nothing about it. So what I've been thinking a lot about lately is kind of like what is the theory that should underpin these, these coercions or these combinations? Like when you combine a date and a date time, what should you get? What should happen when you combine a factor and an integer? And I've been sort of thinking about this in this package called vectors. And the goal of this package is, in the long run, like most people will never have to know about this package. The goal of this package is to have this kind of underlying theory that means you can kind of, you can generalize your experience from one function to other functions. So you never have to explicitly learn about it. The idea of this function, this package, is that hopefully other package developers will use it and so that their packages will behave in the same consistent way. So that when you go to use a function, you can more accurately predict what it is going to return, what type of thing it's going to return. And so I'm going to show you a few examples of vec underscore c. This is the exact equivalent of the c function, but expanded from that kind of simple single line I showed you before to be like a little bit more complicated. Okay, can everyone read that? Okay, is that big enough? Cool. Okay, so I'm going to load the vectors package, and when I use vec with atomic vectors, it's going to behave exactly like C. So I have a logical vector and an integer vector, or a double vector here technically, I'm going to get a double. If I have an integer and a double, I will get a double, and so on. This is another great bit of like historical trivia. Why do you put a capital L after a number to indicate it as an integer? L does not appear in the word integer anywhere. Uh, this is because at the time it was written, like C had these things called long integers, which were the equivalent of integers in R. And there was also the thought that if it was a capital I, you know, you might get confused between the lowercase i for imaginary numbers and the uppercase i, uh, which seems a little spurious now because I, I have never ever used a complex number. Okay, so it behaves pretty similarly in most cases, but it's a little bit stricter. So for some things it will not allow you to do, it will not allow you to turn a number into a character, because that just seems a little bit too dangerous to me. And the other thing that's kind of cool about it is you can tell it like, I want a specific type of vector at the end of this. I want you to combine these things together and give me an integer vector, which you can't actually see that's an integer vector, but if I STR that, you'll see that that's an integer vector. So I can request a specific type of result from C. What happens if I combine two, factor, two factors? Well, you get what you expect, a factor with the combination of the levels. Demoing this function is like kind of lame because I'm just like, well, what do you expect in it? And you get it. So what happens if you combine a date and a date time? Well, you get a date time. What happens if you combine a date time and a date? Well, you get a date time. And uh, the one thing you'll notice is that you get the, the dates become midnight in the same time zone as that date time, which is quite important and quite difficult to do. Now. And then if you just concatenate a date time with nothing or with itself, you don't lose the time zone. Now, you might kind of wonder why I'm like talking about the C function so much, because you don't actually use it that often. But it turns out like this is exactly the same. Solving this problem is exactly what you need to do when you like bind two data frames together. If you're using R bind and base R, or bind rows from dplyr, you're stacking multiple data frames on top of each other. Conceptually, you're doing the same thing. You're making one long vector from lots of short vectors. And we need to have a reason about exactly what type of output you should get from various types of input. And I think this kind of lens of types is a useful way to look at many of the packages in the tidyverse. 
Like dplyr, for example, is basically all about uh, functions that take a data frame or something like a data frame and do something to it. So mutate, filter, select, arrange, summarize, all they do, all, they, all of them take a data frame as an input and return a data frame as output. And I think that's one of the things that like makes dplyr easy to use because all of the functions behave the same way at this high level. The only exception is group by, which is a little bit different because group by doesn't really do anything, right? It doesn't actually change your data in any kind of obvious way. All it does is change how other operations apply to your data. And it does that by taking a regular data frame and turning it into the special groups data frame which also have the indices of each of the groups. But there are a few that are a little bit more complex, like the if underscore else function. And so here I'm gonna take a brief detour to talk about if else in base R. How many of you have used if else before? Okay. Again, this is another useful function. If you don't remember anything else from today, remember conflict in if else. So basically the idea of if else is to be a vectorized if and else statement. So you give it a vector of inputs that are true or false. You say, what do I want to do if it's true? What do I want to do if it's false? And it gives you a vector of results. So here I have randomly ordered the numbers between one and 10. And then if, when I divide them by two, they have remained zero, I want to say it's even. Otherwise I want to say it's odd. And this is going to give me a vector the same length as the input. Right, so if I did this with an ordinary if statement, like I said, if x, what's going to happen if I run that? If you're familiar with other programming languages, you might hope to think it's an error, but uh, it gives you a warning, right? An if statement only takes a single value, so it's only going to give you a single result. So if else, the if else function like does that, but for every single element of a vector. And if like C, if you're using if else with atomic vectors, life is pretty good. So the first argument to if else is always a logical, and then if the true value and the false value is a character, you'll get a character vector. If they're both integer, you get integer. If they're both double, oops. You don't get it into the end, you get that double. <laughs> but life is not so good if you start working with S3 vectors. Oops. I get this vector that just contains the number one, which is completely consistent with C, right? But not very helpful. And similarly, if I try and use it with a date, then I get these dates just converted to the numeric representation. Also not. And there's even some more weirdness. So here I have a if else statement where one argument is an integer and one argument is a double. And I'm going to call them a missing, a true, and a false. And I get a logical, an integer, and a double. So if you call if else with a logical, integer, double, you could get an integer back, you could get a logical back, or you could get a double back. And you don't know unless you actually know what all the inputs are. So one of the things that I think, that I kind of notice, like when I'm doing reviews and pull requests, one of the things I look at is, can I predict the type of this variable? Because if I can predict that what the type of this variable is, it gives me kind of a sense of like the, the shape of the code. Not like exactly what's happening, but what's going on. And so when I see code like if else, I'm like, well, I can't really predict what's going to happen just by reading the code. I have to know exactly what the values of that code. You have to predict what it does by running it, which seems like an undesirable problem. And so I think, like, I don't, I don't know what these should return, but what I do know is that there should be, like, one principle. Right, that ideally, if you call if else the logical and an x and a y, or I won't claim if else is never going to change because it can't. But if we call like vet if else, hopefully, or ideally, the same rules that would, would apply for vec underscore c. Right, that there should be one set of rules for combining vectors of different types, not a slightly different set of rules 
for every single function. And a lot of the, the motivation for this work is currently like in BASAR and in the tidyverse, there are like at least seven different rules for combining vectors of different types. And that means like it's very difficult to like I mean, maybe you could sit down and memorize them all, but you're never going to learn them naturally just by experimenting with code. And so that means when you, you're going to get a lot of unpleasant surprises because you can't accurately predict the types of output. Now, I kind of I, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a version of this in dplyr called if underscore else. Uh, unfortunately. I wrote this before doing all this thinking about vectors, and it's kind of aired on the other side. Instead of being very um, <laughs> lax, very permissive, like if else, if underscore else is kind of too strict. And so when I say combine this vector with an NA, you're going to get a, an error. Because this is not a double. Uh, this is a logical. And you have probably never ever thought about that because you never have to think about that because R normally just takes that logical missing value and automatically converts it to the type. But so if you want to use if underscore else with missing values, you have to learn about the theory of the typed NAs. And unfortunately, the type of NA or the special NA that gives you a double NA is called again for historical reasons NA underscore reason. In a underscore real. Right, so this is really unappealing, right? Because if underscore else is a really convenient function, like if you are teaching people how to do data science, you'd probably like to be able to teach this fairly early. You'd certainly like to be able to teach it before you get into the theory of like, oh, there's actually four different types of missing values, and they're called this, and their names are confusing, and you'll never remember. So I don't want to give the impression that I think the tiny verse is perfect here, yeah, it's far from perfect, but my goal with this work and this package is to hopefully kind of come up with a consistent theory and then apply that theory everywhere so that you just internalize that theory, you don't have to learn it explicitly, you know, you can if you want, if you're that sort of person, that's awesome, you can read all the documentation, you can learn the rich and beautiful theory that underlies it, but for most people, uh, you can just use R, use the tidyverse, and over time, your predictions about what a function will do will hopefully just get naturally better and better. So to finish up, kind of what I've talked about today is one of these sort of things that I think a lot about as a programmer, but I think is also important to think about, like regardless of where you are today on the spectrum between practitioner and programmer, and even identifying that spectrum I think is really useful. That like how far away are you from the code? When you are like when the code and the data are right there in front of you, you can you can act in a certain way, you can explore very, very freely and very, very fluently. And this is like the this is the massive strength of R, that it is not just this programming language, but it is also an environment for doing interactive data analysis that it gives you the ability to have a conversation with the data, it gives you this ambiguity because you're right there having a conversation, you can resolve that ambiguity when you need to. But over time, like as you start to share your code with other people, or as you run your code, not just on your own computer, but on other servers, or maybe every day in a production server, thinking about this, thinking about like, how can you move from having a conversation to like a scripted series of instructions? How can you write code that complains and screams early and often on your own computer so that it doesn't end up like screaming somewhere else so that someone else screams at you? So if you found this talk entertaining and you want more entertainment, you have two choices. I really recommend this full video about these Norman doors. So these are the doors that you like, you try and push, but you're supposed to pull or vice versa. Uh, these are called Norman doors in honor of Don Norman who kind of like recognized and described them. Really nice overview of his work. I really recommend the design of everyday things. Um, with one kind of small caveat, and that is I think like appreciating good design is a little bit like appreciating fine wine. Like 
It's not clear that you actually end up enjoying like the best wines anymore, but you certainly like hate the worst wines much, much more. <laughs> so um, I, I think like I think one of the things that I am kind of like good at is I'm like exquisitely sensitive to bad design, and that can make my life like frustrating and un unhappy at times. Uh, I also really recommend this WAT talk. Uh, WAT, I think like WAT, I think is. Um, I think it's sort of an interesting um, derivation. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like what, right? It's a more surprising than what, it's whacked. And I think, I, I, this is never explicitly said anywhere, but I think there's a similar, there's this sort of like quacks, this like noise in like Zen Buddhism to like kind of shock you out of your ordinary way of thinking. I think it's kind of similar to that. It's cool. If you'd like to learn more, uh, if you want like a gentle introduction to the theory uh, that underlies this, you can have a look at the second edition of Advanced R, which I am working on currently. This has a bunch more diagrams that uh, explain how R, how the types in R work together and are connected. So as well as the uh, atomic vectors, which I briefly talked about, there's also lists of null. And uh, those go on to build, uh, oops, build data frames and tibbles. And in the second edition, I have drawn so many more diagrams than the first edition. So even if you just like skim through and look at the pictures, hopefully you will learn something. If you want to be hardcore theory, uh, I'm kind of writing a bunch of vignettes for the vectors package. Uh, which I have to say is still the thing about this package I like the most is the logo. Uh, but I think it's a pretty awesome package, even though hopefully no one will ever have to, or very, very few people have to think about it. There's a bunch of vignettes that are mostly and still being written, but will hopefully give you some idea. And then finally, if you'd like to see the slides for this talk, they're up online at this lovely link. Thank you. I forgot to tell you a couple of things about housekeeping because of the excitement. But so we have time for questions now, and then we will have some cakes. But please do come up with some questions. Now. And uh, we have this funny mic. Okay, correct box. Which we can throw throw to you, <laughs> throw at you. <laughs> okay, so I uh, I followed the discussion on our dialogue about uh, the C, how you imagine the C should work. Mm -hmm. And my thinking was that uh, I started as a practitioner and now I'm more uh, on the programmer side. And when I, when I do programming, actually I mostly want to check the type uh, of the input. I know what types of inputs I expect and what I'm prepared for, so I want to make, I want to ensure yep. that those are the correct types. If I, or sometimes I'm a bit more on, on the lazy side, I accept several types of vectors, then I call maybe a custom a homebrew coercion function by which I ensure that those will be the correct type vectors, and then I can just go see. Yeah, because I know what I'm prepared for, what I expect. I know what I want to get in the end as a return value. Yeah. And um, so if you, uh, I, I'm a bit unsure whether you can predict all possible expectations about how the C should work uh, on different types of the different types of inputs. Yeah, so, so I should say, you've said like insure many times. I don't know if you're like referring to the insure or a package, <laughs> but this is a, another, um, there's a number of packages that allow you to kind of make assertions about what you think the types of things should be. And I think this is like a really good idea. This is like a really good defensive programming practice. And I think it's kind of almost sort of orthogonal to the vector's work. 
where the idea there is like, how can we do like a little bit of like default? Like it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be values coming in in ways that you don't expect. But I think about like you you want like this like defense and detail. You want like multiple when you really want to be programming carefully. You want to make multiple assertions kind of in multiple places. So you get this like double entry bookkeeping. Um, this is also kind of related to like most or many of the, the data ingest functions in um, the tidyverse also have some way to kind of specify like read CSV as this read underscore CSV as like this call types. Where if you don't supply it, it tells you, well, this is what I've guessed. And you can copy and paste that specification and use it next time. So if something changes, you get an error. Um, so I think, yeah, there's not just one approach. You want to be like checking, you want some good understanding theory, and you want to like assert when you load your data. Like you want all of it. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the whole title. It's really great and it's very easy to teach to students. Uh, I, I noticed that lately, uh, you know, the tidyverse uh, logic started to extend to um, modeling and machine learning uh, and Bayesian statistics in the tidy models package, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be also also a package that aggregates other smaller packages. Uh, could you please tell a bit about the plans about how how you imagine it will move forward? So this is the the tidy. I don't think there's a tidy models website yet. Uh, there is a tiny models website, um, but it's not the oh there's that's impressive. Maybe say when you search for tiny models, you found oh uh, yeah this this is not the tiny <laughs> models. So to imagine that's amusing uh, and unrelated. So the tiny the, the idea of this is to basically provide like a system of packages um, to kind of solve like the, the modeling part of, of data science, to help the, the, the modeling part of data science. Uh, so this work is led by Max Kuhn, who wrote the, the carrot package. And a lot of this, like quite a big component of this is just kind of, like carrot is this one giant monolithic package. And a lot of this work is just pulling out individual little pieces so they, they could be reused more easily by others. So kind of a few big pieces like his recipes. Oh, that's not the right recipe. Recipes, recipes <laughs> tidy. Oh, there is something I think it's on. Uh, okay. So recipes, which basically, like one of the big challenges of fitting models is you have a data frame and every modeling function takes like a numeric matrix. The idea of recipes is to go from your data frame to that matrix. Uh, this is sometimes called feature engineering. So like the idea is to kind of pull out these pieces so other people can use them so that like when if you are like a statistician interested in developing new models, like you care about taking that numeric matrix and doing statistics to it to get something, some smaller matrix normally, you typically don't care about like handling missing values and doing like encoding of factors and all this other stuff. So the idea is to kind of like, can we tease apart those pieces so that people implementing models can just implement what they care about and then use this other infrastructure when they need to. So there's, a, there's sort of on that, on like the developer side, and then what, what hasn't quite come together yet, I think, um, but it's happening in the parsnip package, which I don't know if it's public yet. Is it still in Nexus? Yeah, so the parsnip package. This is supposed to be like a play on carrot, like the vegetable <laughs> carrot. 
very, very complicated. <laughs> um, it's too too complicated. But the yeah, so the idea of this package is to then like take all of these like decomposed pieces and then recompose them like, to give you like a high level interface for modeling where you can still dig down the individual pieces if you want to. Um, the other thing that I, that Max is sort of starting to work on is to also think about, like in the same way like dplyr kind of abstracts away where your data is stored, you can work with in the same way, never the data frame or on a database or on Spark. Hopefully you'll get the same benefit with this framework. So if your data is in Spark, you can use like the Spark modeling functions to get really high performance using an interface that you're already familiar with. Any other questions? Maybe just pull me. Thank you. It will be a bit of a more generic question. It's, uh, I'm a friend of R, and I also very active in the local PyData community. So I would like to ask what your views about do we see a convergence of uh, different uh, scientific or analytic programming languages? Like now there are, we have PyData, like Julia is kind of making inroads. And we have very nice projects like Apache Arrow uh, trying to bridge this with this uh, gap between the between the languages. So what what do you see? Where do you be in five three years or five years time in terms of cooperation in this data science world? So I mean, my hope is that through projects like Arrow, we can kind of converge on like what's important about that, like how to store it and how to share it and how as much as possible to kind of share the important like high performance code around it while still allowing kind of each community to have its own like special flavor. You know, I think the special flavor of R is this like interaction, this, this fluid ex exploration, whereas Python is like, you know, much more programming focused and a little more production focused. So how can we, I hope, my hope is that we can kind of, you know, collaborate on the things that cross cut all of these languages cooperate on those and then allow, you know, greater variation on top of that. I, I don't, I absolutely do not see it as like a war between Python or R. Uh, I don't think like Python is going to win or R, R isn't going to win. I think the one thing I'm absolutely certain of in like five years time, there are going to be so many more people programming data science than there are today. There will be more R programmers, there will be more Python programmers, there will be more Julia programmers. It's just such a like, you know, fundamentally using data to make decisions leads you to better decisions than not using data. And, you know, as that impacts like every area of society, you're just going to need so many more people with these skills. Any more questions about anything, really? Well, uh, I'm sure there are many, many other questions, but we are just too shy to ask in front of this audience and having a live stream. So I suggest that let's thank Hadley again for the great talk and then and, uh, making this trip to Budapest. And because meetups are not only about like formal talks, but other fun stuff as well, as well, like what you can 